Hello? <laughs> That's the whole concept of cheap yeah. prices. Yeah. And it's like, doesn't matter what you do or how you live or anything. It's like, that's totally not in line with a whole lot of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Most, not all of it. And the, what it always amazes me is people are perfectly willing to, for example, quote St. Paul on, on one thing that suits their agenda, and then they just won't deal with the next paragraph in Paul. And, um, so that's kind of a problem. Did you get a chance to? Not yet. Uh, you have a set over there if you want them. Oh, okay. What okay. we're doing for reading is um, this guy Bonhoeffer um, ran a, a small clandestine seminary in the late 30s while the Nazis were taking over the country. And he took over the church in Germany. And uh, so those that objected to the Nazification of, of the church. We're trying to train people for the ministry independent of the sponsored schools. And so they were using people like Bonhoeffer and had these young men living in, you know, like 30, 30 of them at a time. And his place was in uh, Finkenwalde, which is now part of Poland, up near Gdansk. And uh, he knew that he was going to have this assignment, so he kind of prepped up for it. And when they got shut down by the Gestapo, he wrote Cost of Discipleship, or his title was just Discipleship. And that was pretty much what they taught in the, in the school. And then he wrote another one on how they live together. So that's called Life Together. And uh, uh, they're really interesting books. This discipleship is pretty much a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And unlike most people, he doesn't treat it as lofty philosophical ideas that you should aspire to, but rather simple, straightforward, irrevocable commands from Jesus, your Lord. <laughs> so that changes. Uh, the game quite a bit and then of course the thing with Bonhoeffer that is um, he he wrote a lot so they are able to trace the development of a thought from early writings up until the time this book was published and then he in a very intriguing way 
journal while he was in prison, and one of the guards snuck his notes out, and uh, he was working on a book on Christian ethics, and so you can see him as a young person thinking that uh, a real radical stance for peace was contrary to the natural order and blah, 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 and then in mid-career he is one of the most outspoken and passionate pacifist that has ever been in the church, and then he dies for his involvement in the plot to kill Hitler. And it's like, what the heck is, you know, it's like, how do you hold that paradox together? So um, that's what we're looking at. Can I ask, as far as the way he presents this, this is from the 1930s, I presume, his yeah. original writing. How does the seminary teach this, the Lutheran seminaries today, and how do they, how does it fit with what the ELCA is preaching today? Um, I don't know what they're doing today, and I'm 40 years out, so when I, I was disappointed when I got to seminary and found out that I was the only one in my class that had ever actually read Luther. Um, when I decided to go to the seminary, my pastor, a guy named Gene Hansen, um, met with me weekly for a year and we walked through the Book of Concord, which is the collected confessional documents of the Lutheran Church. And he walked me through that from page one to the end of the index um, before I ever went to seminary. Um, and my pastor before Gene was a guy named Kermit Johnson who grew up Lutheran and then he became a Presbyterian in a foxhole in the Korean War. <laughs> He's the one that got me on to Bonhoeffer. Um, but we had nothing of Bonhoeffer either the first year in Philadelphia or Gettysburg the remaining years in Philadelphia. So all my professors knew of him. That it wasn't like he was unknown to them. But the, the problem with the curriculum of the seminary is you have all these people feeding in. We want pastors to know these things. And it, they say it's a mile wide and an inch deep. So, you know, like you get one, maybe two courses on preaching. Um, you get, you know, uh, kind of a 101 church history and then another one on Lutheran confessions. And so you're exposed to a variety of things, but there's really not a lot of time to dig deep. And about the cheap grace versus obedient grace, I'll call it. Um, That's a big deal. That's a major shift in how it's uh, addressed. Is everything go, everything goes like Mike says, or is it mm -hmm. got to be obedient to be, have grace and have faith? Generally what the school did, and I don't think it's changed, is Lyman um, Ladeen, who was one of my professors, said that it's very easy to get into legalism. And what's really difficult is this concept of grace. And when Dean would talk about, if you try to say the gospel is the cross of Jesus Christ, and you don't put a period and just stop, then you're going to say, well, it's the cross and and everything after the word cross is just legalism. And so they pretty much count that out. And then what ends up happening is grace is, like Bonhoeffer says, it's laissez-faire, anything goes. And so um, I'm a little bit hesitant to take on your constitution because in 2009, one of the things they did under the name of grace was all that stuff that about sexual morality out the window. About the only two things that I can think of that would get you in trouble is not what, for my lifetime anyway, was considered to be a, uh, deviant sexual behavior. You could get in trouble for having sex with a parishioner, uh, particularly if it's a child, and anything else is okay.
but it's grace. <laughs> and they are perfectly, well, for example, the 2009 National Convention that I asked where your Constitution was approved, there was a 30-year-long uh, series of social statements and studies in human sexuality and blah, blah, blah. And in any democratic process, two or three people with an agenda are eventually going to win and just wear it down. And so there was commission after commission after commission and Bible studies and all this kind of stuff. And if they didn't like the Bible study in year A, they'd get a different scholar in year B that would give them a different answer. And it just kept going and going and going. And you all may know the name Saul Linsky from national politics. He was the guy that, um, I think he was at Harvard, talking about how to destroy democratic institutions. And it's a playbook on how to do it. And um, that those techniques were deliberately employed on the human sexuality thing. And for example, on the vote in 2009, when they finally voted to change the, the LCA stance on things, they kept putting it off until uh, dinner was being delayed and um, a good number of the delegates were gone to get food and so forth, and then they voted. <laughs> you know, it's just really, if you were trying to work a change in a faith community where you really respected everybody, you wouldn't be doing dirty, underhanded political tricks. And, uh, but there was, this group that was not going to take no for an answer, they didn't care how long it went, and uh, it passed by a razor thin margin, and as soon as it passed, the building got hit by lightning, <laughs> and some people wanted to interpret that as a sign from God that he was not happy with it, <laughs> and others were, no, it means he liked it, and <laughs> so um, everything is grace, and and it's always in line with uh, pick the most liberal social political agenda on any issue, and the ELCA will be the first to line up behind it. I would think the Church of Christ is probably the first. Not the Foot Church raised. of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> or the Episcopal. Yeah, I mean, all of the so called mainline Protestant churches have gone that way. and. Um, they're not going back. You look at the source of their clergy, they all go to the same schools, they, they read the same professors, they vote the same political patterns. Um, I don't, I may be the only registered Republican Lutheran pastor that I know. <laughs> so, uh, and that didn't used to be the case. It used to be Lutheranism was a pretty mainstream and it just isn't anymore and uh, that's disappointing to hear I guess to me that the judgment that takes place within the church should be the church not a political agenda mm -hmm. but the real church and people are a lot smarter on that than I but it seems like it's being taken out of context yeah that's I mean that's my opinion you'd have to you could get any other Lutheran pastor in the state and they would object to me. <laughs> My one good friend, Jonathan Jenkins, said, you know, when you get brought up on heresy trials, I think I can defend you. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, it, um, there are less middle of the road conservative politically pastors in the LCA since 2009 because a bunch of them, there used to be this Lutheran core and so forth, but uh, pretty much anybody coming on board now is not bothering with the LCA. They're going to the North American Lutheran Church and they that church has started its own seminary and I um, can't remember how to pronounce her name properly either. It's a pastor from this synod that's the dean out there. Um, she switched 
churches and Amy, I can't remember her last name, um, but the, it used to be at the Synod Convention there was a group around Lutheran Corps that would uh, caucus and so forth and the last year there was like three of us. So it, um, but it's it, at a theological level it goes, goes back to a legitimate interest in what is the grace of Jesus Christ and the reality is anything that you think, say, or do that implies that your relationship with God depends on you and your effort is missing the point of grace. It's very radical. Mm -hmm. um, the best, Beth Ludwig, she's remarried, I don't remember her new name, um, and I've mentioned this before, she told the story of when her son was born, he was breech and looked like he had you know, been in a fight, but he came out of the womb all beat up from breech delivery and all this kind of stuff. And he's over in the Hanover uh, nursery and Beth sort of got herself over and standing there at the glass admiring her new son. And couple of bassinets down there was this very petite very pretty little girl that was a couple of weeks early and had a normal birth and had a perfect little head and a pretty little face and the mom and dad are standing there hooing and nodding over their baby and then the dad points down to Beth's son and goes whoo who could love a face like that and Beth turned and pulled herself up to her whole to all five feet and said his mother and I've always thought that in that moment, that is a God's grace to us moment. It's like, kid didn't do anything other than really put a hurt on his mother. Um, it was a tough pregnancy, a tougher delivery, and there he was, and she was in love. And it's like, that's God's grace. That's our relationship with him that's the foundation of who he is and who we are and who we are in him and you get the fullest expression of God's love for us by Jesus going to the cross and literally taking on himself our sins and the consequences of our sins and pulling all of the powers I mean this is a cosmic fight on the cross where Paul alludes to it when he talks about powers and principalities in the air. and um, There is a whole spiritual world that we are sometimes aware of but don't have good information on that is maleficent and wants our death and destruction. And Jesus pulls all of that stuff to Golgotha and defeats it, judges it, carries it to hell, and consigns it to eternal death. And then he raises from the dead and says, I'm extending this life. And oh, by the way, I'm also going to give you my spirit so that you are not alone, that you have an advocate, that you have the personal transformation and the gifts to do this life. And it's all shoved across the table up front at the beginning. And you can't earn it. You know, he loves you. He went to the cross not just for the whole world, I mean, that would be plenty, but it's specific to each individual. And he's just sitting there going, you can't stop me, I love you. That's grace. And um, that's really radical. And what we want is to do something about it. <laughs> we want to um, have done something to bring it about, something to continue as theater. It's like, we want to get in the game. Um, and the truth of the matter is that uh, everything in the Christian life flows from that grace. It doesn't create it. So, you know, like Luther was trying to explain this, it, um, 
there's a handful of theologians in the history of the church that got that. Augustine of Hippo was one. It's not an accident that Luther was an Augustinian. Um, Ambrose and Milan and um, Anselm and you know just uh, Benedict even um, and Bernard or Clairvaux just they pop up from time to time in church history and they really get this radical grace and somebody asked Luther one time, he said, well, what do we contribute to this whole business? And he said, oh, we contributed the disobedience, sin, and death part. <laughs> so if, if that's true, and that's, that's the thing that makes Lutheran different than everybody else. Um, the Episcopalians don't, you know, it's like Pelagian, who's the we contribute a little bit was English. <laughs> so the Anglicans, um, you know, the Lutherans keep a hard line there. The Anglicans have a semi-porous border there. Uh, the Catholics just went over wholesale, like, eh, we don't like that, so we're going to drag this old dead Greek philosopher named uh, Aristotle, and we're going to piggyback on some of his stuff, and if we don't like something, we'll just pretend like it's not there, and and we'll superimpose our stuff on Aristotle. And they have this idea that um, you can decide, like Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics says, the way you become virtuous is you pick a virtue that you want to be in your life, and then you work at it until it becomes, and you know the words, second nature. So the Catholics take that, and they say grace cooperates with that seeking virtue in Aristotle, which puts the human being really heavily in charge of their own eternal destiny. And it feels good. I go to Mass. I pray to Venus. I go on retreats. I do this. I do that. And the Holy Spirit encourages me and empowers me and all that other kind of stuff. And Luther goes, no. The Holy Spirit in the, in the Augustine phrase, prevening of grace, which means you never had the thought without the Holy Spirit putting the thought, to have the thought into your head. Grace is always leading. So it, it, that's, a, that's pretty radical. And most Lutherans don't get it. <laughs> um, and I don't know of any Protestant group, and certainly not the Catholics or the Orthodox. I mean, it, there there are individuals within every confession that you know really pray through the Scriptures and listen to the Holy Spirit, and and, and the light comes on. But Lutheranism is the only place I know that really wants to enshrine that radical notion, and it's hard because you know like. A friend of mine, Rick Price, who's uh, manager at the Toyota in Lancaster, he, he and I were talking one time, and he goes, okay, so what constitutes a good church member? You know, it's like, give me a checklist. Because, you know, I, I, he knows what a good mechanic looks like. And he can tell you exactly what a good mechanic does and doesn't do, or a salesman, or, you know, it's like in his world where he's managing you know, all those people and uh, can differentiate between, uh, he said, you see a car, I see a little bag of money. Uh -huh. <laughs> and my job is to trade that little bag of money out for a bigger one. And he doesn't care if it's a Jaguar XJE or, you know, it's just a car. And I paid this much for it and I got to get this much to pay my costs and I want a profit on top of that. You know, he, he thinks like that. And so we were talking about church, church membership, and um, what constitutes a faithful Christian. And it, it was like, there isn't such a list. Isn't there a difference between a church member and a faithful Christian? Well, that brings us into a, a, a <laughs> problem in the Lutheran church around the issue of baptism. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm, I'm quite convinced that it's an apocryphal story told by some silver tongue devil preacher that at Borms, April 18th, <laughs> 1821, on the 17th, Luther got dragged before the emperor and the princes of the empire and the legates of the church and these are your documents. And he said, can I have 24 more hours to think about it? And the prince goes, oh, it's dinner time. <laughs> Bring back tomorrow, we'll cook him tomorrow. And um, so Luther gets taken out and he's you know, making sure that he's not gonna run away kind of thing. And he was up all night by himself. And the story is that he was kind of running through what he was facing because a hundred years before, a professor named Jan Hus had said and done the same thing and they cooked him. Um, so Luther's facing pretty much a death sentence. And he's thinking, you know, um, I used to be a priest and a monk or a friar in the Augustinian order, and my confessor kicked me out of the order. <laughs> and I got defrocked as a priest, and I've been excommunicated. I'm not even a Catholic anymore. And I am an enemy of the empire, and my mother can't give me a sip of water without putting herself in jeopardy of capital punishment and they have taken everything from me, but they haven't tried to touch the fact that I'm baptized. And so he says, I'm baptized. Who am I? I am baptized. Dietrich Bonhoeffer did the same thing, and you saw it at the end of the film. He has a poem that I think is in, certainly in this green covered copy of it behind me they called Who Am I? Uh, Bear Binish. And Bonhoeffer's situation there at the end in Tegel Prison was um, the books that they allowed him, his peeps were starting at the back of the book, and every other page putting a very teeny, almost imperceptible little dot of pencil underneath a letter, and then backwards through the book, and there would be maybe phrase or sentence in a book this size and I'm pretty sure they didn't do it in straight up German they may have done um, you know something else like he spoke Greek, Hebrew, and Latin you know um, but they communicated with him so he even though he was in isolation he at least had some idea of what was happening and when the von Stauffenberg with the briefcase bomb failed. They knew the game was up. And so he had been stalling, you know, hoping that these plots would, would be successful. And so he had to present this facade to the guards of, I'm innocent, you know, just a simple country preacher that. <laughs> It's a double agent for the out bar. Um, <laughs> but he, um, for his own sanity and you know, struggling to maintain, this is who I am, he did pastoral care, he did counseling with the guards and the prisoners, and um, the Allies were bombing the snot out of Berlin as the war was coming to an end, and these guys were stuck in cells with bombs dropping on the building, and. Uh, they couldn't escape and so forth. He tried to keep people calm. He prayed with them and so forth. So his public persona was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Herr Doctor, you know, and that kind of thing. And yet, to himself, he was scared, just terrified. You know, it's like nobody sits there in a bombing and is calm. You know, it's like um, one time I was visiting some of our forward observers up on an OP at Fort Sill. They shot out of safe, and we got shrapnel, and it, it ended the conversation instantly. <laughs> as soon as that thing went off, we knew yeah. that it wasn't supposed to be going off there, and um, I was staying on the ground talking to Sergeant Cummings, and he literally just backwards, five foot drop down onto an aluminum floor on the inside of the APC, didn't even think twice about doing it. He just went backwards, 
because he was up in the air and was an air force. I dove mm -hmm. underneath the track and hoped the driver didn't try to drive out with me under the tracks. Um, it changes everything just like that. And he's stuck in a cell. Um, you're terrified. And uh, the poem basically says, you know, I'm walk they tell me I'm walking around like some younger out in East Prussia on my land and confident and cool and in control and all that. And on the inside, I'm terrified. Who am I? Am I this or that? And he ends the poem by saying, whatever I am, Lord, I'm yours. His is baptized. And um, when you think about baptism, we've cleaned it up. You know, it's always, not always, but almost always, a cute little baby in a beautiful gown that grandmother, you know, put together. And it's, it's a presentation of the child and kind of a public naming right and you know and all that's great you know uh, brings families together and I always encourage lots of pictures and um, we did one here nice font great family it was fun um, but what Jesus's salvation of us is is much more like uh, the Hershey Lifeline guys dropping in out of the sky in some horrific accident and they're doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on some broken and battered bleeding body with if you've ever been there you don't know how many flies there are in the world until there's blood and vomit on the ground and I got involved in one one time and you can't even get a decent seal to do the respirations because of the vomit and the flies just, it's ugly, it's dirty, um, it just, it's horrible. And what Jesus is really doing is CPR on a maggot infested corpse on the side of the road, breathing life into them than a, a stage photo opportunity is a naming right for a cute middle class kid. You know, it's like, what we do here doesn't help us to visualize spiritually what's going on and Jesus comes for us when he doesn't have a reason in the world to and uh, he literally reaches into the cesspool of our lives and pulls us up and gives us life and adopts us as his brothers and sisters uh, the story of the prodigal son coming home with uh, the father wrapping his talith around him, calling the servants, barbecue the 4-H cow, um, bring me shoes, put them on his feet, put a ring on his finger, put clothing on him, uh, anoint his head with oil, let's have a party because my son who was dead is now alive again. That's grace. That's baptism. Now, how do you balance that off against since it's Third Reich time? Every single one of the major Nazi leaders was baptized. None of them were excommunicated by their church. That's pretty extreme. I mean, um, I think you negate your baptism when you embrace neo-German paganism, but that's just me. Um, yeah. How do you maintain the integrity of what you have to say about baptism against the reality of um, yeah. well, Goering, Reich Marshal, Air Marshal Goering. Uh, they kept a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor at Nuremberg for the trials all the way through the executions and so forth and he was rewarded for his service to the country and the church by never getting another job again because the army ordered him to stay and he did and then the Missouri Synod um, but he provided pastoral care to the guards and prisoners at Spandau prison and the night before Goering was supposed to be executed, he called for the chaplain and said, I would like 
to receive absolution and communion in case it's true. And the Missouri Synod Lutheran chaplain said, go to hell. He turned around and walked out. <laughs> to be involved in Jesus' judgment of creation and we are going to be called upon to discriminate between truth and falsehood. There are so many people who are baptized because the church just baptizes anything that moves that um, are not in any way, shape, or form committed to the Lord. There was a Catholic missionary, I think named Xavier or something, that would go through the markets in China and flick holy water on the crowds and say, I baptized so many people today. Um, pretty crass, not very good theology. <laughs> um, baptism, um, I think, requires some kind of relationship. Yeah. Um, but how do you you know, there are, there are plenty of people who got their heads wet that are could not be convicted in a court of law of being a Christian due to lack of evidence. Yeah, um, same for their parents. Exactly. Yeah. Because you know, I think that's their duty to trot up their little one, the elder, and they don't care. I've seen it time and time again, people you've never seen in church before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, they're not there, but they, you know, have their little their baby. Yeah, you're right. As much as do it every As much as it bothered me, my, some of my grandchildren are not, um, and you know the parents were like, it, you know, they're just babies. If they decide they want to be baptized when they're older, that's how they're feeling. So you know, well, and that's but, the, but that's not a hundred percent. A horrible thing. There's a guy down in New Freedom that, that calls it drive by yeah. baptisms. Yeah, I mean, at least they're giving thought to it and letting it. But you're right. And parents just come. And, and think about the phrase when they decide and grace. Ah. Like That's a good point. the soldier that I was involved with, the, there was a ammunition convoy and a couple of the trucks were going too fast and flipped. It was bad. There were bodies everywhere, fire and ammunition, and helicopters coming in, and all this kind of stuff. He did not ask Sergeant Widener and I to do CPR on him. We just did it. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't stop us because he was kind of out of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Right. He was, he was going to get saved whether he wanted to be or not. Yeah. So when Bonhoeffer, back to the book, <laughs> the circumstance that he's in, um, the, the church after, in the late 1800s, you started to get um, a really significant move away from the way they used to train clergy where seminaries were run by sitting pastors who were in congregations and everything was uh, based on the confessions and I'm looking around for where did we put the book of Concord? In case you've never read it, <laughs> this is um, the Book of Concord, where you get names like Concordia Lutheran Church and so forth. Um, in the generation after Luther, there was big discussions about, well, what exactly is it that we believe, teach, and confess? And so they had a big gathering, and people uh, hammered out, okay, what do we believe, teach, and confess? And so they took, uh, it begins with, the apostles, 
Nicene, Athanasian Creed. And that very important to these, quote, evangelical theologians that this be the continuation of the Catholic Church in the sense of the universal Church of Jesus Christ. And they have documents in there, uh, one called the Augsburg Confession, which was delivered at an imperial congress in the city of Augsburg in 1530. And Luther was alive but not present. He had a death sentence from 1521, so he could go as far as Marburg, which is like 175 kilometers north of Augsburg, and he was hanging out in this castle, and that's where he wrote Mighty Fortress, by the way. Um, and there was a courier with messages going back and forth, and the Lutheran theologians that were in Augsburg were headed by a fellow named Philip Schwarzerda, who changed his name to the Greek Melanchthon. And he was the Greek professor at Wittenberg, lived next door to Luther, and they were uh, really good friends and colleagues all of Luther's life. And uh, Melanchthon is kind of the guy that cleaned Luther up. <laughs> sat on some of his more radical things. But Melanchthon wrote the Augsburg Confession, and then when it came up on the docket, he read it to the emperor. And the next day, the Catholic delegation stood up and said, everything he said is wrong. And the emperor goes, okay, you're refuted, so give it up, and let's get on to talking about the war with the Turks. So on the way home, Melanchthon sat down and wrote, I would call it an explanation, he called it an apology uh, to the Augsburg Confession, and where there's a paragraph on justification by grace in the Confession, there's 64 pages of explanation of biblical exegesis in the apology to the Augsburg Confession. So it's um, the short form and the long form. They're in that book. And um, it used to be that you're seminary education was biblical studies and the confessions. Boom, boom. And to get ordained, you had to sign a copy of the Book of Concord. As far as I know, I'm the last pastor in what used to be Central Penn and turned into Lower Susquehanna where I did. I haven't seen it in an ordination since. I mean, it may happen all the time, I just don't know about it, but um, uh, my ordination was irregular in a couple of things, like Bishop suddenly got called out of town and McCarney and went to Lutheran World Federation for something, and his assistant, Guy Edmonston, did the service, and then Guy got elected bishop, so he ordained me before he was a bishop, <laughs> and I signed the confessions, but that was standard. And um, that's the way they were trained. And it was across the board. And of course it was male only. And um, I knew one guy in Germany that wanted to be a pastor and they wouldn't let him because he had a club foot. And they were taking things out of Leviticus where uh, if you have any kind of skin or deformity or injury or whatever, you can't serve and they did that for pastors so it was like um, that's the old way so the church that he grew up in got exposed to this new textual criticism where you brought in techniques that historians use to evaluate documents and you evaluate the scriptures that way and initially um, you know they're you know like for example Matthew Mark Luke and John are not the same book. They are four versions of the same story. You know, they're about the same person. And each one has its own characteristics, but that started out as they're inconsistent, they're, they contradict each other, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's only when all the news media goes away and you get down to 
all right, boys and girls, get out the stubby pencils and let's start going through this and why, 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 why. And in 10 million seminars, it gets hammered out and you suddenly realize that um, they're a lot like portraits and the artist is painting the story of Jesus. It's emanating out of who the artist is as a person and who the intended audience is and the language and all that kind of stuff. And you, what you end up with is this amazing amount of consistency with the individuality. And then you find out things from Mark, like we talked last week about the chiasm. Um, Mark looks like a country bumpkin. His spelling sucks, he's not fluent in Greek. Uh, he's choppy, he uses the word immediately 54 times, and just <laughs> chop, chop, chop. There's no transitions. No nativity, no resurrection. You know, it's like this is not very good. And Luke says so. Others have tried to write this story, and <laughs> I'm. I decided that I was going to do it. I. E. I don't think they did a very good job, and I'm going to, you know, clean their stuff up. And so, 85 to 90 percent of Mark is reproduced um, in Luke, and also over 90% in Matthew, and they both fix his spelling, fix his grammar, <laughs> insert transitions. And Jesus was a great preacher. Do you think we ought to have a sermon or two of his, you know, and just to give people an example. So um, you can kind of think of Mark as pretty crude, and then you start getting into it, and you realize that Mark did all of this thinking way ahead of time before he ever pe put pen to page, and there's a, a phrase that it's metalepsis, which is a literary device where Paul uses it all the time, Mark does as well, but you make either a use of a word or a phrase or an allusion to an idea to something in the general background, like the entire middle part of Isaiah from a phrase, and you realize, oh my God, he's talking about return from exile as salvation. And so he's just brought in like a freight train worth of material in three words. It's like, that's pretty good. <laughs> so they started training in that, but when the, the church in Germany was very academic and bringing in all this avant-garde stuff at the beginning when it was like, it slices, it dices, it makes Julia fries and you know, um, Bonhoeffer was unique in that he grew up in that environment and World War I destroyed the illusion of liberal theology. For Bonhoeffer, a beloved older brother named Walter was killed at the front and his idealism about throne and altar and the fatherland and all that kind of stuff went away with a telegram, Walter Bonhoeffer dead, stop slap in the face. There comes a guy, a name you really need to know, named Karl Barth, B-A-R-T-H, a Presbyterian or Reformed theologian from Switzerland who um, hit the street with a commentary on Romans that just lit the world on fire. He, instead of trying to argue from you know, soup to nuts, detail after detail after detail, he just came out and said, the living God gave this revelation, St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, deal with it. <laughs> and he just jumped right in, and Jesus is who he said he is, he meant what he said, he, and when he said it, and you know, boom, 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 and Bonhoeffer is a student of Karl Barth. So he breaks with the you know, the liberal theology that makes citizenship and baptism all the same kind of thing. So he starts out speaking to a church that is petty bourgeoisie. Mm. You know, it's like, it's more important to be a good middle-class German. That's what it means to be Christian, to be a nice middle-class German who pays his taxes and all that kind of stuff. And Bonhoeffer uh, writes, cheap grace is the mortal enemy of our church. Our struggle today is for costly grace. This is a very Barthian kind of beginning. 
Cheap grace means grace as bargain basement goods, cut rate forgiveness, cut rate comfort, cut rate sacraments. Grace as the church's inexhaustible pantry from which it doles out by careless hands without hesitation or limit. It is grace without price, grace without cost. It is said that the essence of grace is that the bill has been paid in advance for all time. Everything can be had for free, courtesy of that paid bill. The price paid is infinitely great, and therefore the possibilities of taking advantage of and wasting grace are also infinitely great. What would grace be if it were not cheap? That got a lot of attention. Cheap grace yeah. means grace as a doctrine, as a principle, as a system. It means forgiveness of sin as a general truth. It means God's love as merely a Christian idea of God. Those who affirm it already had their sins forgiven. The church that teaches this doctrine of grace thereby confers such grace upon itself. The world finds in this church a cheap cover-up for its sins, for which it shows no remorse and from which it has even less desire to be set free. Cheap grace is thus denial of God's living word, denial of the incarnation of the word of God. Cheap grace means justification of sin, but not the sinner. Because grace alone does everything, everything can stay in its old ways. Our action is in vain, the quote. The world remains world and we remain sinners, even in the best of lives. Thus the Christian should live the same way as the world does. In all things, the Christian should go along with the world and not venture, like 16th century enthusiasts, to live a different life under grace than from under sin. The Christian is better not rage against grace or defile that glorious cheap grace by proclaiming anew a servitude to the letter of the Bible in an attempt to live in an obedient life under the commandments of Jesus Christ. The world is justified by grace. Therefore, because this grace is so serious, because this irresistible or irreplaceable grace should not be opposed, the Christian should live just like the rest of the world. Of course, a Christian would like to do something exceptional. Undoubtedly, it must be the most difficult renunciation not to do so and to live like the world. But the Christian has to do it, has to practice such self-denial so that there is no difference between Christian life and worldly life. The Christian has to let grace truly be grace enough so that the world does not lose faith in this cheap grace. In being worldly, however, in this necessary renunciation required for the sake of the world, no, for the sake of grace, the Christian can be comforted and secure in possession of that grace which takes care of everything all by itself. So the Christian need not follow Christ since the Christian is comforted by grace. This cheap grace as justification of sins, but not justification of the contrite sinner who turns away from sin and repents, it is not forgiveness of sin which separates those who sinned from sin. Cheap grace is that grace which we bestow on ourselves. It is the preaching of forgiveness without repentance. It is baptism without discipline. It is the Lord's Supper without confession of sin. It is absolution without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without the living incarnate Jesus Christ. Are you translating mm -hmm. from German? No, I have a different... Oh. Uh, I wish I could. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, the reader of my dissertation said, Rick, you speak German on a level you can order French fries. And he goes, I translate... Pannenberg for French fry money. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's his critique of state church liberal Lutheranism, and um, like they say, if the shoe fits, where it that is like could be read right today. Yeah, that, I feel like that's mainline. Exact like, same thing. A bunch of mainline churches, but I'm not even going to pick on the Lutherans. Well, they're all. The same. You know, they're all 
into respectability. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, alternatively, costly grace is the hidden treasure in the field for the sake of which people go and sell with joy everything they have. It is the costly pearl for whose price the merchant sells all that he has. It is Christ's sovereignty for the sake of which you tear out an eye if it causes you to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ which causes a disciple to leave his nets and follow him. So this liberally trained Lutheran pastor and theologian is saying if there's grace there you know it's like if you chuck a rock into a pond there are ripples if you chuck grace into the pond the ripples that flow from it are discipleship and oh by the way the word discipleship in German is Nachfolge which means to follow after so if you are a disciple of Jesus you walk away from everything else and you go where he goes and you do what he does and if you have a question about something in your life you do what he says that's discipleship and so he goes on costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again the gift which has to be asked for the door at which one has to knock it is costly because it calls to discipleship. It is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs people their lives. It is grace because it thereby makes them live. It is costly because it condemns sin. It is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, grace is costly because it costs it was costly to God because it cost God the life of God's son. Quote, you were bought with a price. And because nothing can be cheap to us, which is costly to God. Above all, it is grace because the life of God's son was not too costly for God to give in order to make us live. God did indeed give him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. So he's literally not saying anything new. Every one of his allusions, like seeking, knocking, you know, that straight out of scripture, you know, there immediately comes to mind. And the the order is what's important. It's the the movement of God that makes everything happen, whether it's cosmically or international relations or personally. Um, it, you know, God always is the subject of the sentence. And we are the direct object of whatever verb God's using at the time. You know, uh, in this crock of, I decided to accept Jesus as Lord. <laughs> well, what yeah. do you do? Um, try that out on um, the judge. Like, you get hauled before the traffic court and he said, I don't recognize the court system in Pennsylvania's right to tell me how I drive my car. <laughs> See how that goes. Yeah, I mean, there are some things in life that are prior to you. <laughs> so, um, just a couple more things here and then we got to stop. Costly grace is grace as God's holy treasure which must be protected from the world and which must not be thrown to the dogs. Thus, it is grace as living word, word of God, which God speaks as God pleases. It comes to us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes as a forgiving word to the fearful spirit and broken heart. Grace is costly because it forces people under the yoke of following Jesus Christ. It is grace when Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, I think in the earlier translation about here, there was a 
um, a phrase that really stuck with me over the years. It's like costly grace, you know, uh, calls a person to come and die to themselves. And in that exchange where Jesus is Lord, uh, St. Paul says to live is Christ, to die is gain. So um, in the discipleship relationship, Jesus is Lord. He is the one who has all the initiative. And um, the irony of that is it sounds like and feels like you're giving up your autonomy and your integrity as a person and all that other kind of stuff, but the reality is sin so perverts us that that autonomy and individuality that we crave so much is so bent and perverted that it's at best an illusion, and it's only under the yoke of discipleship to Jesus that we actually become truly human and truly unique. It, it, there's that twist. And so uh, it begins there. And but who do I owe money to? <laughs> well, like like Claire said, I went at the beginning when I when I started reading this, I, I like what it's. I, I really and and I saw you on Sunday and you said, oh, I don't feel. It's like. You felt like you were living, you know, like you just said you could put the chip on it. But I under, but it you're, pulls you back to the legends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he, that's, but uh, yeah, it's it's really a thinker. When I started reading it, I didn't want to stop. So I don't think it's that hard of a read. <laughs> and he, he writes in a more palatable style to me than N.T. Wright did. Mm -hmm. That was all mm -hmm. over the place. This thing is he's focused. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, like I was reading the introduction. There, there's a critical edition that Augsburg Fortress. That um, it, it's amazing to me how much of Bonhoeffer's handwritten notes survived. You know, like yeah, the Gestapo all confiscated yeah. all of his papers in Berlin and kept them, and they survived the war. <laughs> and so scholars are able to uh, go through it. But there's a path through his writing, the, um, the two big things that he wrote early, one was um, the communion of saints, and the second dissertation was act and be about how do you make decisions, you know, how, how does one make decisions in life, is act and sign, and um, he, uh, there's these threads that you can see the development, and there's a high level of Consistency between uh, communion of saints, act and being, cost, life together, and then what intrigued people about so many things about Bonhoeffer that were intriguing. He um, was working on a book on ethics, and they've actually published it, um, and it's massive. <laughs> it's hundreds of pages, and it was just his notes. He never got around to actually like doing the rewrite for publishing. And so people read that, and there are these journal entries and letters that he wrote, and um, he, he wrote to Epihart Betka, who was his administrative assistant, best friend, and married to his niece. And he said, you know, Epihart, I've been thinking about religionless Christianity in a world come of age. More later. <laughs> and there was no later. It's like, Holy Moses, yeah, what I, does that mean yeah. for a state church, old Prussian Union, Lutheran guy where, you know, in Germany, the Internal Revenue Service collects your church dues. 3% of your gross income goes to the church. You can opt out. But if you do, you get nothing. One of my sergeants was married to a German girl from Augsburg. Her mother died. And she had opted out of paying the church tax, and she didn't get buried in a, a consecrated cemetery. 
She didn't get last rites. She was Catholic. She didn't get communion. She didn't get anybody praying for her. She got nothing. And her daughter woke up every night for half a year screaming. And so her husband came to me and said, I don't know what to do. And I said, I do. And we'll meet at the cemetery. There's a secular cemetery. And we went over there and talked for a little while and prayed that her mother would rest in peace. And the nightmare stopped. Mm. And three days later, I was summoned to Dr. Freudberger's office. He's the dean in Augsburg at the time and got read the riot act. I'm like, who the hell do you think you are interfering in internal German church matters? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, wow. And of course I was very submissive and I said, who do you think you are talking to me about providing pastoral care to one of my soldiers? <laughs> <laughs> and we stood there toe to toe, him yelling at me in German and me yelling at him in English. And uh, I said, what kind of a pastor are you that can't see a woman tormented and are worried about a prayer? Yeah. You know, and he goes, you don't understand, you're interfering with things. And I said, yeah, I do understand. And I said, let's take this to the Lord. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So okay. it's a different kind of church when it's a state church. And then you go religionless, you know, like no institutions, no government collecting the tax for you. No clergy, um, in Germany at the time, they had this pay scale where the average laborer got X amount of marks, and then jobs were rated, and you got above that. So like a, a pastor got five times the amount of money that a laborer got. You know, teachers, pastors, blah, blah, blah. Lawyers got seven times, you know, that kind of thing. And it's all carried from soup to nuts, full health insurance. Um, 30 days of paid vacation a year, not counting weekends and holidays. So, you know, like you want to go on vacation and there's a national holiday in concert with it, would not count against your, your time. You know, it's like you get that day off and you get Saturday off and you get Sunday off. And so you're taking one day in one week and four days in the next, it's five days. And, oh, you're gone for 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's right. like, um, you know, German socialism. And they're very comfortable. You can't touch them. And he wants to do away with it and let the Christians stand on their own two feet. <laughs> chapter two. Um, in this chapter one, if you haven't got to it yet, there's a thing about Luther going into the monastery and then his coming out of the monastery is a big deal for Bonhoeffer. He sees, um, the, it, he used to go into the monastery for being a super Christian. And they talked about it being, you know, like vows as being better than baptism and guaranteed entrance into heaven. And, and you know, monks are superheroes and, and so forth. And, the irony in Luther is he was seeking that and it's when he walked away from it that he really was impactful as a disciple of Jesus in the world and um, if you think about it in a certain way uh, how many people have you know that have been interested in their spiritual life and they get told oh you should go into ministry mm -hmm. it's like that sounds good on one level, but it's really like, we really don't want to have to mess with you, so we're going to shove you off into this safe little corner, and we can continue to live our lives without you being a problem. <laughs> and you really are a problem if you're a fully committed disciple of Jesus Christ in the workplace. But yet he said monasticism saved the church. It did. Yeah. Christianity was wiped out in Europe and then some Irish monks came back across the English Channel the other way and reintroduced it. So they said they had two levels of Christianity, the, the, monks, the monks and everybody else, which was a lower level. Mm -hmm. so that, that's why I'm not a Roman Catholic. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, I mean, the, the human thing of success and achievement and title and position and all that kind of stuff. We do that, and status is the only word I can think of, and what's really radical about um, 
Christianity is, um, and Luther said it on his deathbed, he said, all beggars, one beggar telling another beggar where to get a free meal. And just to be radical, and you can fire me, and I'll be gone in a, in a month if you do. Um, <laughs> last night at the council meeting, for that individual to sit there and say, if she's in this building, we're not coming. I want to say, what the hell makes you think you're better than her? Yeah. Did Jesus not die for every single one of us? Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, if, if my sins were thrown up on a big teleprompter or you know, those big screen things, I'd be trying to find a hole to crawl into. And that's true of every single one of us. And one of the things that Lutheranism has over everybody else is, you know, Luther was convinced, you know, like if you're 16, you're going to express your broken, sinful nature with the only thing you have, your body. And when you're 90, you're going to express your sin with the only thing you have is your name on the deed of the family farm, and you threaten to excommunicate anybody that doesn't do what you want. It's the same sin just being expressed in the most convenient vehicle to you. And you never stop being a sinner. Ever. Simul use et precator. Justified by Jesus Christ and in the same moment still a sinner. That's radical. So yeah. My one battalion commander was a Mexican Catholic, and he told my endorsing agent, he goes, he's the closest thing to a priest I know. I'm not a priest. I'm baptized. And for some strange reason, the church in a hard time said, all right, we'll let you <laughs> preach and teach. But this dick guy said, if you think God's calling you into the ministry, you better hope he calls you loud enough for me to hear. God bless Dick Guy. Yep. That sounds like him. 